Today's video has been made possible thanks to Displate. Displate creates Displates, which are one-of-a-kind metal posters designed to capture your unique passions. They created a 21st century canvas that's sturdy, magnet-mounted, and durable enough to withstand a lifetime of intense staring. Displate works with amazing brands such as Star Wars, Marvel, DC, Back to the Future, South Park, Batman Begins, and so much more. But they also have works from great and successful artists, like the ones that my colleagues behind the camera have chosen for me. And I have to say, I'm more than happy with their pick particularly this one. Some of our team are actually based in Spain, and come on, us Brits love a Spanish holiday. No matter what your passions are, there's a display for you. With over 40,000 artists, there are over a million of designs available. What's more, they are crazy durable, super easy to mount and rearrange, there's no need for power tools, and you can move them between rooms and houses and even countries, and they will still look great. Click on the link in the description below to customize, collect, and curate your favorite designs. Even better, there's a special offer for our visual politic community, 25% off when buying one or two designs and 29% off if you buy three or more. When you follow the link, this exclusive discount is automatically applied to your shopping basket. And now, let's continue with today's video. Have you ever stopped to think about what it takes for a country to be considered a great world power? And to follow up on this question, do you consider Russia a superpower? Or rather, do you think that beyond its nuclear arsenal, Russia has the necessary ingredients to be considered as such? Just how far is Moscow capable of projecting its influence? And be careful, because despite everything that we have seen lately on the Russian-Ukrainian border, the answer is far from simple. Many factors come into play, but in order to hold the title of superpower, it seems clear that three things are needed. Firstly, military intervention and deterrence capability. Secondly, political influence and influence in international organizations. And thirdly, economic capacity. The question therefore is, does Vladimir Putin's Russia meet these criteria? In military terms, the Russian Federation is clearly a superpower. We are talking about the leading power by number of deployed nuclear warheads, almost 1,500. In addition, Russia has large armed forces that are relatively well equipped, and above all, supported by a huge industrial military complex. And although technologically they do not reach the level of development of the West, it can still be said that they have advanced weaponry. Secondly, it also has political influence and influence in international bodies. Russia is one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council Council with veto power, the same status that the United States, China and the United Kingdom and even France has. However, when we talk about economic capacity or direct political influence beyond the territory of the former Soviet Union, then it's a different story. Russia does not have the capacity to punish third countries with sanctions. It has no major allies that can follow its lead, and it cannot employ economic warfare techniques. What's more, there are only a handful of countries that currently accept Moscow's political leadership. Now, don't think for a moment that we are trying to reinvent the wheel. Not at all. The Kremlin and the Russian president himself are perfectly aware of this reality, or rather, of this weakness. And precisely for this reason, they have been trying to assemble their own network of allied countries for years. Countries that provide Russia with international influence, the ability to lead and access new markets. And take note because we are not talking about China. While it's true the Sino-Russian relationship is very important, fundamental for the Kremlin, they are perfectly aware in Moscow that Russia is not the dominant country in this relationship. China will support them when and how it suits China, no more and no less. So, how can a country like Russia try to build such a network of allies? How far do Moscow's tentacles reach? What tools does Vladimir Putin use to extend Russian influence? Well, you see, since he assumed the presidency in 1999, one of the Russian president's obsessions has been to surround himself with and get control of the oligarchs who run the country's large companies, especially the energy companies. And you know what? Putin has succeeded. Most of the country's large companies respond directly to the interests of the state, and they do so to such an extent that they often become the spearhead of Russia's foreign policy. 
we are talking, visual politic fans, about a model that has within its foundations favours blackmail and privileges of all kinds. We can basically say that the Russian governance model is based on something like you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. It's a game of favours decided in an office with closed doors. And so in this video we are going to see how the Russian president takes advantage of the control he has over the big oligarchs to extend Russian influence abroad. This is the least familiar blade of Russian diplomacy. Listen up. Oligarchs, the hands of Putin. Let's put things into perspective. The fall of the Soviet Union was followed by a period of crisis and political decline that fueled a dream, almost an obsession, among a large part of the Russian population to regain greatness, power, and influence in the world. That's because economic prosperity, good business performance, and career opportunities are, for many Russian citizens, secondary goals. First of all, the number one priority is strength, influence, and power of the motherland Russia. And guess what? Since coming to power, Putin's policies have had exactly that same perspective. National strength above all other issues. But of course, given all the economic constraints that the country has, the question is, the big question is, how on earth do you get it? How on earth do you do it? How do you get leverage against the United States itself? Well, it turns out what Putin's government has done has been nothing less than to try to net precisely all those countries that do not arouse much interest for the other great powers. A good recent example can be found in now, hold on to your chair, in the latest great failure of US foreign policy. I am, of course, referring to the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Today, it is one of the poorest, most unstable, and troubled countries in the world, and one which Russia now has in its sights. Terrorism, jihadism, and the occasional energy project have made Moscow look more closely at the land of the Taliban. Among other reasons, because one of the things Moscow is terrified of is that this country could become an epicenter of jihadism, a base of operations for radical groups. Don't forget that Russia already has a growing problem with this issue. Much of the former Soviet Union has become fertile ground for jihadist radicalization. In fact, Russia is not only home to more than 20 million Muslims, but also became the country that contributed the most foreign fighters to ISIS. So, with all this in mind, after the exit of the United States, Moscow felt the need to gain influence as well as to monitor and keep a close eye on what is happening in the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. In order to achieve this, Putin's government has made use of its strategy of friendly oligarchs. Oligarchs who have names and surnames. And we are talking about one who stands out above all the others, Yevgeny Prigozhin. This man is the owner, nudge nudge, of the Russian president's favorite restaurants, which is why he is known as Putin's chef. As it stands, Prigozhin is a close ally of Putin and devotes part of his fortune to financing political and paramilitary activities abroad. We are talking about one of the most powerful players in Russian political circles, one of the most important oligarchs in the country. No gas, no oil, no coal, restaurants. Well, restaurants and mercenaries. Yevgeny Prigozhin is something of a shadow Kremlin representative, the guy who is entrusted with missions that the Russian government doesn't want to be official, a character who enjoys a virtual monopoly in projecting Russia's ambitions towards the Middle East and Africa, in exchange, of course, for pursuing his own belief. It's a win-win in every sense of the word. Now, a question that I'm sure, I'm certain, many of you are wondering is, how does he go about this? How does he project his influence? Well, you see, Prigozhin is the creator of the Wagner Group. <laughs> The Wagner Group is a paramilitary organization with an international network of mercenaries and dodgy businesses operating in countries where you probably wouldn't want to go on vacation. The Wagner Group has deployed paramilitary forces in countries such as Syria, Libya, Sudan, and are even linked to the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. And not only that, they are also credited with interventions in countries friendly to Russia in order to stifle pro-democracy protests, conducting all kinds of disinformation campaigns and false flag operations. This group was, for example, accused of interfering in the 2016 US presidential election. This group is also said to be dedicated to the extraction of gold and diamonds, most likely from illegal mines. The 
They are not exactly an NGO or a company concerned about corporate social responsibility, environmental, social, and governments, the so-called ESG criteria, or anything close to those issues. As a result, Yevgeny Prigozhin is one of the oligarchs under US sanctions. And yes, we could go so far as to say that Russia has something like two foreign ministries and two defense ministries. There's Lavrov and Shoigu as formal ministers, and Prigozhin as the one in charge of operating in the shadows. Well, it turns out that this Russian oligarch is also the main financier of the Foundation for the Protection of National Values, the FZNC. The Foundation for the Protection of National Values is an organization with a presence in several countries throughout Africa and Central Asia. In the case of Afghanistan, his trusted man on the ground, Maxim Shugale, was one of the first people to arrive in Kabul after the Taliban seized power. Shugale controls a political network under the FZNC that seeks to find areas of security and also economic cooperation between the Taliban and Russia, to look for areas of cooperation and, of course, to be aware of everything that happens in the country. And keep in mind that we are not talking about just any guy, but a very experienced one. For example, he went so far as to be imprisoned in Libya from July 2019 to December 2020 for having met with Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, son of former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, to encourage him to make the leap to the political front line. So what exactly do Putin, Prigozhin, and Shugale want from the Taliban? Well, one of the direct consequences of the Taliban's rise to power is the international isolation of the country. Very few countries want to have ties with Afghanistan. So if the Taliban want to get money, weapons, energy, or information to consolidate their power, who better to turn to than the Russian bear? Let bygones be bygones, but what can Russia get out of a place as inhospitable, impoverished, and desolate as Afghanistan to become the most influential foreign player in the entire country? And you may be thinking, what on earth does anyone want that influence for in such a desolate country? Well. For example, to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a base of operations for jihadist groups that Moscow considers a threat. But that is not all. Moscow is also pursuing what we might call economic geostrategic objectives. There would be the huge deposits of desirable minerals, such as lithium, that Afghanistan has. We are also talking about strategically important projects as this one. What you see on screen is the TAPI project, a huge gas pipeline that, once completed, will allow huge amounts of gas to be transported from Turkmenistan to India and Pakistan. We are talking about at least 33 billion cubic meters of gas per year in the first phase. Taliban regime to deploy 30,000 troops to resume work on the TAPI gas pipeline project. But that's not all. Take another look at the map. Afghanistan could become, for India and Pakistan, two countries with more than 1.6 billion inhabitants. That's 20% of the world's population. What Ukraine has been for the European Union for years. An indispensable strategic enclave to receive an enormous flow of natural gas and oil from the rich deposits of Central Asia. And guess what? The Russians have been wanting to be part of this business for years. Check it out. Russia interested in participating in TAPI pipelines construction. And the question is, why on earth does Russia care so much? Well, basically, for two reasons. Firstly, Russia is a huge exporter of oil and natural gas. Participating in what may become one of the most important routes in the world would greatly strengthen its energy influence. And secondly, if this route is consolidated, Russia could use it in the future to export its own gas and oil. And take note, because estimates suggest that India will devour gas and oil over the next few decades. And believe me when I tell you that the Russians are serious about looking for alternative customers to the European economies, but also to China. The Afghan route and the connection with India could be a way to get a new colossal customer. In this vein, the TAPI pipeline could be extended and eventually connected to the gas extraction fields that Russia and Kazakhstan are developing in the Caspian Sea. We are talking about the Central Naya and Imashevskoye fields, a joint venture between the main Kazakh gas producer, Kazmonegas National Company, and a Russian consortium formed by Lukoil and Gazprom. Both countries have a 50% stake in the project, and for Gazprom, for example, these fields would be its biggest gamble in the Caspian Sea. 
Who would have thought that a territory as impoverished and desolate as Afghanistan could potentially be so important? Well, to make sure that everything is under control, the Russian oligarchs are there, setting up their networks of influence and surveillance throughout the country. In return, the Taliban receive weapons, advice, energy, supplies of various kinds, and even money if necessary. The whole package from Russia. However, don't think for a moment that this is the only example we can find. Just take a look at the African continent and Latin America to find a lot more activity from Moscow. Listen up. The Russian Catalog. Yes, the influence of the United States and its Western allies is very, very great. But it is also true that in some places, this influence is much more limited than in others. It's no secret, and it's something we've already talked about here on Visual Politic. China's influence in Africa has soared in recent years. From investments, infrastructure construction, trade agreements, and technology transfer, the Chinese government has gained a great deal of influence, as well as new customers and new suppliers for its companies. Well, in a way, Russia is trying to do something very similar. Of course, as much much as it pains Putin, Russia is not China. Moscow has nowhere near as a full wallet as Beijing. So the Kremlin has had to look for other, shall we say, more imaginative ways to break through. In the case of Africa, Russia aims to become a major supplier of grain, medicines, and energy. An example of this is that, with more than 7.5 million tons per year, Russia is already the largest exporter of wheat to Egypt. It also intends to use its extensive experience to promote mining and energy projects in countries such as Zimbabwe, Angola, and Burkina Faso. Do you remember the old Yevgeny Prigozhin, Putin chef? Well, it is known that his companies have received concessions to exploit diamonds and gold in the Central African Republic. Another example, Sergei Ivanov, son of former Russian defense minister, is the CEO of Al Rosa, a Russian mining company specializing in industrial diamonds. Because while Russia may not have as much economic capacity as China or the United States, it does have something that many autocratic governments want with all their being, weapons, few scruples, and a lot of experience in intelligence, repression, and security. To illustrate, do you remember the Wagner Group that we mentioned earlier? Well, take a look. In recent years, Wagner Group contractors have been deployed throughout the Middle East and Africa, including Syria, Yemen, Libya, Sudan, Mozambique, Madagascar, Central African Republic, and Mali. They have focused primarily on protecting ruling elites and critical infrastructure. Federica, Saini, Fasanotti, Brookings Institution Analyst. What's more, the Russians and Chinese are very pragmatic. They don't ask about things like human rights, democracy, or the environment, and that quality in this type of country is an advantage when it comes to doing business. Well, do you know what? The modus operandi is very similar to what we have seen in Afghanistan. Russian oligarchs establish themselves on the ground and seek agreements with local managers. Managers who receive such key tools for maintaining their power as access to the complete catalogue of the Russian military industry, with a special section on mercenaries, along with the experience, technology, and know-how they need to be able to exploit their natural resources. In return, Russia gets political influence, new customers, and also, of course, further enrichment for the oligarchs close to the Kremlin. From Libya to Nigeria, and from Ethiopia to Mali. Over the past few years, Moscow has concluded more than 20 military agreements across the African continent. This has enabled Russia to become the largest exporter of military equipment to Africa. To give you an idea, its market share is almost 50%. 13th of September 2021, Russia is building its military influence in Africa, challenging US and French dominance. 2nd of October 2021, Mali's plan for Russia mercenaries to replace French troops unsettled Sahel. And so, visual politic fans, beyond Ukraine and the big headlines, this is how Moscow is trying to increase its political influence in the world whilst gaining new markets for its products. And even more importantly, it gets the dollars its military companies need to continue upgrading their equipment. This is the formula Russia uses to continue to have all the influence a superpower needs. And within this formula, Russian oligarchs and big businesses play a key role. Where the West is not looking, China and also Russia usually have at least one foot on the ground. So what do you think of Russia's bid to extend its influence with the help of oligarchs close to the Kremlin? Leave us your opinion below in the comments. And if you liked this video, then don't forget to like it and subscribe to Visual Politic. And once again, thank you so much for being there. All the best, and I'll see you next time.